This is Covering the Spread, part of the FanDuel Podcast Network. We are finally to the point in NFL training camps where we've got news that matters, news that can impact betting markets, things like signings off free agents, we've got injuries, we've got camp battles that are being settled, and all those things do impact betting markets. So what we're going to do for today is catch up on all the NFL news we have not yet discussed here on the show that has transpired across the past couple of weeks, break down what it means for me with my win total models and some other fun markets over at FanDuel Sportsbook. Then I'll wrap up by talking about NASCAR at Watkins Glen later on. This is covering the spread. That's right here on the FanDuel Podcast Network. My name is Jim Sonis. I am a managing editor of digital media for FanDuel Research here to talk about the NFL for today, break down training camp news, And as I mentioned, we'll go through some NASCAR at Watkins Glen later on. We'll start things off with the NFL here in just one second. But first, a reminder to make sure you're subscribed to the Covering the Spread podcast feed wherever you get your podcasts. We had Austin Cass on yesterday's show to break down this week in EPL. That is uh, for match week number two. Austin went two for two on his bets last week. Two more bets in the show uh, for this week. Find that on the Covering the Spread podcast feed wherever you get your podcasts. Hear what Austin has to say. And also tomorrow, we'll have some more baseball here on the show as well. Get covering the spread wherever you get your podcasts. If you like what you hear, leave us a five-star rating on Apple Podcasts or Spotify. The baseball season is heating up, so get in on the action with FanDuel, America's number one sports book. Because right now, new customers get $150 in bonus bets guaranteed when you place your first $5 bet. FanDuel is safe, secure, and super easy to use. Plus, when you win, you'll get paid instantly. So don't miss your chance to swing big with $150 in bonus bets, win or lose, when you make your first $5 bet. FanDuel, official partner of Major League Baseball. Major League Baseball trademarks used with permission. Must be 21 plus and present in select states. First online real money wager only. $10 deposit required. Refund issued as non-withdrawable bonus bets that expire in seven days. Restrictions apply. See full terms at FanDuel.com slash sportsbook. FanDuel is offering online sports waging in Kansas under an agreement with Kansas Star Casino LLC. Gambling problem? Call 1-800-GAMBLER or visit FanDuel.com slash RG in Arizona. 1-800-NEXT-STEP or text next step to 533-42. In Connecticut, 1-888-789-7777 or visit ccpg.org slash chat. In Indiana, 1-800-9-WITH-IT. In Wyoming and Kansas, 1-800-522-4700. And Kansas, ksgamblinghealth.com. Louisiana is 1-877-770-STOP. In Massachusetts, gamblinghelplinema.org or call 800-327-5050 for 24-7 support. In Maryland, mdgamblinghelp.org. In New York, 1-877-HOPE-NY or text hope and y And in West Virginia, go to 1-800-GAMBLER.net. Let's dig in now to the NFL, and I want to touch on some teams that have had big changes recently across the NFL as we've had some signings, some injuries that could alter things from a betting perspective. Obviously, running backs are not going to move the needle a ton, but I did at least want to touch on the signings of Dalvin Cook and Ezekiel Elliott. Start things off here with the Jets signing Dalvin Cook, and Cook did not have a good year last year. Uh, He had worse efficiency metrics than Alexander Madison as far as rushing yards over expectation and stuff like that. He had explosion at times still, but that's not Madison's forte. But overall, it was not a good year for Dalvin Cook, which is why he was released. But the key here is that none of the Jets' backs, other than Brees Hall, had good years either. Hall averaged 1.4 rushing yards over expectation per carry, according to next-gen stats. And that's a very big number. He was tremendous last year. Michael Carter was a negative 0.6. Zonovan Knight was negative 0.02. Israel Abanaconda looked pretty good in the first preseason game, I thought, but he's also a fifth-round rookie. So Hall is coming off this torn ACL. He can't carry the entire load. So the question is whether Cook is an upgrade over the other guys, over Carter, overnight, Abanaconda, and how much does that matter? I do think that Dalvin is an upgrade over those guys. So I did put in a bump for the Jets projected uh, rushing efficiency, but I also did lower their expected pass to run ratio because they gave Dalvin Cook a lot of money. Uh, Aaron Rodgers the past couple of years has been in pretty rush heavy offenses. Maybe that does translate to this year as well. 
So when you give Dalvin Cook 8.6 or whatever million dollars, that says to me you're probably going to be decently rushed. I mean, you've got two good backs to do it. The offensive line is struggling with pass prote- protection right now. So I think that the tea leaves kind of do say they're going to be a bit more run centric than I thought they may be initially. So that lowers scoring expectation for them in the season as far as like projecting out totals and stuff like that. I had the Jets at 9.8 wins before and they are still there right now, but I will be lowering point total expectations for them in their games because I'm a bit worried they may go a bit more rush heavy than I would like. So downgrading the Jets from a scoring expectation, but the overall win expectation did remain largely the same in 9.8 wins. As for the Patriots with Zeke Elliott, it's a pretty similar thing where, like Dalvin Cook, he's not great. He's coming off a pretty good or a pretty rough year, but he's probably better than the alternative that they would have had running it when Ramondre Stevenson came off the field because someone's got to do short yardage stuff. Stevenson can't carry all the load. So I did give the Patriots projected rushing efficiency a slight boost, and I also did boost their third down success rate a bit because Zeke is good in short yardage situations. So that could allow them to convert in those short yardage situations a bit more often. It doesn't matter a ton for their win total. Uh, I've got them below their win total, even at 7.5 wins. They are minus 142 to go under. We had talked about the Patriots win total under back when it was, I believe, still plus money. Um, But I think that's appropriate where they're at right now. So the value is in the past. It is no longer there. In the AFC East as a division, Patriots are pretty big underdogs right now. They are 8-1. to to win the AFC East. So obviously, you know, pretty big underdogs. I think that's appropriate. Once again, I cannot get to them at eight to one. As far as the rest of the division, uh, Buffalo plus 120. The Jets are plus 250. The Dolphins are plus 290. The Dolphins did lose Jalen Ramsey. So I have downgraded their defense as a result of that. And after you add in the Ramsey injury, I have Buffalo at 10.2 wins, the Jets at 9.8, and the Dolphins at 9.4. So a very concentrated division. I think the biggest takeaway there is that I can't bet Buffalo at plus 120 to win this division. They've got a tougher schedule than the Jets and Dolphins, which is why their win total is lower than you might think at 10.2 wins. I think you could consider both the Jets and the Dolphins. If we had this like a true dead heat, every team would be two to one if we just come to the Patriots aren't there. Obviously, that's not accurate because the Patriots could win this division. There is separation between these teams, so uh, that's not a proper way to do things. But the Jets are plus 250, the Dolphins are plus 290. At least interesting, I'd lean Dolphins right now among this group if I were to bet one of those teams, but I think it's a a stay away from me with where things stand right now. The other what I would deem to be important NFL news was the Russell Gage injury. Russell Gage going down for the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. He'll miss the entire year due to a knee injury for this year. And when you look at this Bucks offense, their win total is six and a half wins with the over a plus 116. After I add in the Russell Gage injury, I've got them at, at exactly 6.5 wins. And that's actually the second lowest number in the entire sport ahead of just Arizona for me, at least. The one point against being low on Tampa Bay would be the infrastructure around the quarterback. Specifically, they got Mike Evans and Chris Godwin. Offensive line is not that bad. And... If you've got a non-elite quarterback, having guys like that around you can elevate everything in, in a pretty good way. So if the Tampa Bay Buccaneers were to exceed expectations, it'd be because of that infrastructure. But that infrastructure does take a hit without Russell Gage because they're going to rely on uh, probably a rookie um, to try to fill that gap. Now, from a division perspective, that doesn't impact things much because I, I still think the Saints are the best bet there, a plus 130. The Bucks, though are in play for some grim bets, uh, some other markets that might not be quite as enticing. So looking at teams, the team to have the worst record in the NFL, the Tampa Bay Buccaneers right now are plus 950. That is the second shortest number behind just the Cardinals. And I get why. I do think the Bucs are viable in that market. But if you're looking for value stemming from the Russell Gage injury, which decreases the expectation for the entire offense, I think you're going to find a different market. That is for the team to score the fewest points this year, which you can find right now at FanDuel Sportsbook in the season specials market. And right now, the Texans are the favorite there, plus 450. I think that's honestly a bit wild, given that their offensive line is pretty good. Their pass catchers have some upside. Cardinals are 5-1. to To find Tampa Bay... 
You have to scroll all the way down to 16 to one for them to be the lowest scoring team in the NFL this year. This is a team with a defensive minded head coach who said last year when he had Tom freaking Brady as his quarterback, that they wanted to be run centric. They, ra- they ran the ball despite the fact they were awful at it this year. They don't have Tom Brady. They're probably going to be run heavy. Once again, they got an offensive line to do that. And their offensive expectations just went down because they did lose a decently key member of this offense. So Tampa Bay at 16 to one to score the fewest points in football this year. I think is really, really fun. Obviously, Godwin and Evans do impact this market, but maybe they decide to go Kyle Trask, tear things down and try to rebuild a quarterback room that is absolutely the worst in football as of right now. I would not be shocked if that's the route they do wind up taking. I do not think in any world the Buccaneers should have longer odds in this market than the Broncos, the Rams, honestly, even like the Bears and Commanders. I don't think it should be longer than any, any of those teams. So to me, if you want an actionable potential bet based on the NFL news we have seen across this week. I think the biggest one is betting the Buccaneers 16 to one to have the lowest scoring offense in the NFL for 2023. Finally, let's finish things up here with Anthony Richardson. The Colts officially did name him the starter for this week. And I baked in that as the expectation from the start did have like a possibility was Gardner Minshew about 10%. Uh, but If we put Richardson in there as full starter, their projected rushing efficiency is very, very high because it's a rushing quarterback who boosts that himself, but also he opens more lanes for other guys within the offense. And that does matter quite a bit. Now, obviously, Jonathan Taylor, if he can't go or if he decides not to go, that would impact things here in a negative sense as well. Taylor Left the facility last night. It sounds like that was more for a personal matter and not due to his contract. Maybe. I'm naive, um, but it sounds like we're potentially trending towards a resolution there at some point. Obviously, rushing efficiency does not matter as much as passing efficiency, but it is still in the model for sure, especially if you're going to be a run-heavy team. You want them to be better running the football. I do saw the Colts uh, pretty even with their win total at 6.6 wins. I don't think they'll be a great offense. I think it'll be fun to watch because Richardson is is exciting. I'm not sure how good he'll be right now, but... They might not score a ton. Now, they play indoors, which is why I'm not super intrigued in checking out them in the lowest scoring offense market as we discussed the Tampa Bay. Richardson, though, is plus 150 to win offensive rookie of the year uh, for a quarterback who is now confirmed as a starter. It's not a bad number. Bryce Young, 4-1. to B. John Robinson, 3-1. to Richardson will get attention because he's going to have some highlights. He'll put up really good rushing numbers, and he plays indoors, as mentioned. If I were looking at this market, the rookie of the year market, I would lean towards CJ Stroud at nine to one as being the better bet because he has a better offensive line than Richardson has right now. His pass catchers are at least interesting is what I would say. He's also playing indoors against a not elite defensive division. So Richardson is a consideration at 750, but I do think that Stroud is a better option at nine to one with where things currently stand. We'll talk some NFL again next week. Uh, JJ Zachary is going to be on the podcast next week. Talk some season long player props and break down his thoughts on those markets. He's been fantastic at pinpointing good value there in the past. Looking forward to talking to JJ once again next week. For this week, though, let's transition now and talk some NASCAR for this week. Because NASCAR, the Cup Series and Xfinity Series are both in Watkins Glen and the Finger Lakes in central New York. It's the second to last race before the playoffs. And Chase Elliott is desperately in need of a win. Almost got it last week. Michael McDowell held him off. And you got the narrative here with Elliott, but also it's his best track and a track where my model adores Chase Elliott. I have Chase Elliott at 18.7% to win. That is a very big number for a Cup Series race, given how competitive those races are right now. But he's plus 350 at FanDuel. FanDuel knows Chase Elliott's good. FanDuel knows Chase Elliott needs to win. So we're not going to catch them sleeping here. Its implied odds are 22.2%. So I cannot bet Chase at plus 350. I did bet him personally earlier this week at five to one elsewhere, but plus 350 too short for me. And there's not much outright value elsewhere on the board because both Chase Elliott and Kyle Larson are very high in my model but not not high enough to be values themselves at plus 350 and 5 to 1, respectively. So outrights to me right now are a stay away. 
There is some value in the top 10 market, though. So let's talk about that first. There are two bets I like in the top 10 market with where things currently stand at FanDuel Sportsbook. And those are uh, in Ross Chastain at plus 195 and Austin Dillon at 6 to 1, which are both available right now over at FanDuel Sportsbook. Chastain was plus 230 yesterday. I'm still showing value with him now after shortening to plus 195. The new implied odds there are 33.9%. My model has Chastain at 39.7% to win. And I understand why the market is low on Chastain because his form recently has been awful, both on road courses and non-road courses. Last week at Indy, he was not super competitive, even though he had two teammates finish inside the top 10. Obviously, his teammate won at Chicago as well. So Trackhouse has been good. Chastain is not. With that said, his form turned down at Darlington. That was kind of after that race is where things really started to get pretty bad. He did still finish top 10 in Sonoma. So that was encouraging. And again, even though he's been outrun by his teammates, it's encouraging to me at least that Trackhouse has had good speed in each of the past two road courses. So we don't need Chastain to win. We don't need him to have a ton of upside to cash this ticket. He could do that because he is generally a good driver in good equipment, but I think that having the flexibility of having him finish, you know, in the back half of the top 10 to me is reassuring. There are also fewer ringers this week. I think that uh, taking out Shane Van Gisbergen, that does actually impact top 10 markets because it's one less very viable driver to contend for that. So that benefits Chastain as well. So I think with where things stand right now, unless you think Chastain is totally broken as a driver, to me, plus 195, very good market to get him in. Other one, as mentioned, is Austin Dillon. He is currently 6-1 to one to finish top 10 at FanDuel Sportsbook. And he's not a great driver on road courses, but he's been a lot better recently. And he can get good finishes because he does tend to finish. Now, this year is a bit different. His best finish this year is 16th on a road course. But two of those were because of wrecks. He wrecked at Coda and wrecked at Chicago. He wrecked in Chicago while running third, but that was due to strategy. So... Overall, this year, it's not been the best for Dylan on road courses. The speed has still been somewhat good, especially last week. He had a 15th place average running position in that race. He's had a mark of 17th or better in two straight races at Watkins Glen. And if you look at Dylan overall during the next-gen era, he has a 20% top 10 rate on road courses in this span. The implied odds here are 14.3%. I've got Dylan at 18% for a top 10. So... Dylan at plus 600 and Chastain at plus 195 are the top two bets I like right now for the Cup Series at Watkins Glen. On the Xfinity Series side of things, we have both Kyle Busch and Ty Gibbs in the field, and also Alex Bowman. Bowman's driving a Hendrick Xfinity car, which I assume is basically a junior motorsports car, which means very good equipment. We've seen the Hendrick cars on road courses run very, very well in the past. So you really got three guys, three superstar bangers in this field between Bush, Gibbs, and Bowman. My, my model does like Bowman a lot. It's not quite as high on him as the market. The downside of that is that if we're going to bet anyone else to win this race, we need to make sure they've got the upside to beat some really, really good drivers. And that's scary for sure. The one guy I do like most to do this is Austin Hill. He is currently 22 to one to win at FanDuel Sportsbook. And I do show value at that number. And I find Hill very intriguing as a somewhat long shot here. Hill has been lurking the entire year on road courses, actually the entire two years. Ever since he joined the Xfinity series, he's been very good on road courses. He had an issue at Coda, but since then, his finishes in road courses have been fifth, eighth, fifth, third, and fourth. That fourth place run last week came behind Ty Gibbs, AJ Allmendinger, and Sam Mayer. Sam Mayer. Mayer won at Road America, Dinger and Gibbs, tremendous road course racers. So basically, we need some chaos. But if we do get any kind of chaos, especially with uh, Gibbs, Bush, and Bowman, we would see, I think, Hill in the mix for a win. He did this last year, too. Finished top five basically whenever he didn't wreck on a road course. He hasn't shown that in the upside markets yet. But the markets reflect that at 22 to 1 to win this race. His implied odds to win are 4.3%. I think that's underestimating him a bit. And it's fully accounting for the fact that there are other really good drivers in this field. I got Hill a decent amount, amount above that. It could be because I'm underestimating Bush and Gibbs. And I think that's a very fair critique and a very fair potential downside here. But Hill is a good road racer. He's in good equipment, which does matter at Watkins Glen. If you can get him to finish top five, I have his odds there 
he's a pretty good value in that market and other books. But I don't mind the upside play giving that a look at FanDuel with him being 22 to 1 to win. Obviously, again, it does require a really good race from Hill to beat those kind of guys, but I think that he's capable of it. And I would not be shocked if he wins a road course race, whether it be here or the Charlotte road course to close out the year, especially the Charlotte road course where there won't be any cup drivers. I think Hill there could be very, very fun. So Hill to me, 22 to one, my favorite bet for Xfinity for this week. That's all we got here for today on covering the spread back once again, tomorrow with, with some more baseball to close out the week. No pitching ninja because he's traveling this week, uh, but we'll be back with some more baseball regardless for tomorrow to get that. As it is posted, make sure you're subscribed to covering the spread, wherever you get your podcast. If you like what you hear, leave us a five-star rating on Apple podcasts or Spotify. If you've got any questions for me, I am on Twitter at Jim Sonnes, J-I-M-S-A-N-N-E-S. You can also follow FanDuel Research at FanDuel Research. I want to thank you all for tuning in for today. Good luck to you with your bets across Thursday. We'll talk to you once again tomorrow to close out this week. This has been covering the spread right here on the FanDuel Podcast Network. 